Thank you very much, members, and um, I declare the meeting open. Um, this is the Communities Committee meeting on the 7th of 7th, 8th of July, 8th, 8th of July, 2021. Um, just to confirm, uh, to advise that there are currently four members on Starleaf. That is Andy Allen, Alex Easton, Karen Mullen and Mark Durkin and one in the meeting room which is myself, Kelly Armstrong. I'm standing in for our chair, Paula Bradley, who sends apologies for lateness. Paula should hopefully be with us in the next 30 minutes or so. Um, any other members that arrive in via Starleaf will note their attendance. Um, just moving on through the agenda, because we are court now, um, to remind members of the requirement to declare any interest they may have in relation to items under discussion today. I'm going to move on now to apologies. Um, we're aware of apologies from Pam Cameron. Um, we don't have any other apologies today, folks. No. Um, yeah, we're just um, Sinead is a little bit late. She'll be arriving soon. Okay, so um, apologies for lateness for Sinead Ennis, and um, we'll mark her as present once she arrives. Karen, thank you. Um, just moving on then um, for a chairperson's business. I know I'm not the chairperson, but in Paula's absence. Um, so just there's a few items that we need to clear up in advance of summer recess. Um, members, it's normal practice for committees to delegate authority to the chairperson and the deputy chairperson during periods of recess to submit views on the releasing or withholding of information in any non-routine or contentious freedom of information requests received. The committee would be advised, of course, of any such requests, um, the views that were expressed by the chairperson and or the deputy chairperson, and the response that would be issued by the Freedom of Information Unit at the first available meeting following the recess period. Members, can you confirm by saying aye if you are content with this for this practice to continue? Aye. Thank you. Aye. Um, aye. No, thank you very much, members. As you know, we will continue to receive correspondence during the summer recess. Last summer, the practice was to upload correspondence to SharePoint and then to email a cover note to members on a weekly, fortnightly basis, depending on the volume of correspondence. The cover note will remind members to access correspondence documents on SharePoint and to advise committee team if they want to highlight an any in the first meeting back in September. Are you content that we use the same process this summer? Content. Thank you. Um, Officials have asked me to let the committee know that following their briefing to members two weeks ago, the information that there was 14 young people with disabilities starting work with Department for Communities has changed. Unfortunately, three have dropped out at short notice due to personal circumstances. Officials are continuing to work with the work coaches to fill the three vacant posts as quickly as possible and they intend to bring the number back to us and back up to the original 14 as soon as they can. Um, have members any comments or are they content to note? Content to note. Thank you. <coughs> members will take sure. a note. Sorry, go on ahead. Sure, just very quickly on the previous point in relation to correspondence over the summer, I'd, I'd raise my hand there, I don't yes. think you'd seen it. Um, can, can I just check um, if, uh, for, by any chance, welfare mitigations are approved to the executive um, in preparation for moving forward? Uh, and I know it would be, be somewhat preemptive, but the welfare mitigations do have cross-party support. Is there any way for us to commence our call for evidence over the summer period in preparation for the autumn? I'm just looking to close. Sorry, yeah. Andy, I didn't see your, your I hand. I think that would be quite difficult, to, to be yeah. fair. Um, we're ready. Well, we're going out for a call for evidence on the charities bill over the summer. Um, it would take a lot, you know, a fair bit of work to get that together and the team. Yeah. Andy, um, the clerk's um, just we'll, saying here that would be difficult. We'll, we'll cross that bridge if it comes to it, and I, would be, I will be advised if it's coming to that, and we'll see what we can do. But... Um, I, I don't think I should promise anything at this point. Um, I, am, <clears throat> I know that um, I've had it indicated that if necessary, the Minister may require a recall of the Assembly in order to get the first stage moved. I think once we get to that stage, then we'll have to revisit that to see what's coming forward. Um, I know that as a committee, we have already said that we will do what we need to in order to move it forward as quickly as possible. I think we all recognise the need for that. but. At this stage, without legislation in place, um, we'll have to wait on the Minister for that. But you're absolutely right, Andy. Um, we are likely to 
um, see some, well, we're ho all hoping that we're going to see something sooner rather than later, but I think at this stage we can't preempt. We'll have to wait and see what's going to come down the line to us. So um, don't book holidays, as they say. Um, oh, Fra, sorry, have you raised your hand? Sure, I'm oh, sorry, sorry for being late. You're fine. Uh, for, for, for the meeting. Uh, I perfectly understand uh, what Andy has said. I think all of us uh, have been over a period of time uh, arguing and debating around the urgency of, uh, of legislation like this. And if, if, the, if the minister uh, is it meant to, uh, to, to, to ask for the, 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 the assembly to be called at a specific time, uh, if we can also tie in with that and maybe have a meeting uh, 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 to, to call a special meeting of the committee uh, so that we can, uh, we can uh, to, to discuss uh, the recommendations. I don't know whether that uh, would be difficult to organise or manage, but it may, it may actually uh, help on it in, in, in what he said. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the officials could advise us on that there. Um, certainly, I mean, it's, it's not beyond the, the realms of possibility of holding a meeting over the summer. It wouldn't necessarily be the usual committee staff. It wouldn't necessarily be this team. But there, there is obviously process in place for meetings to be held if necessary. And um, we just, again, have to cross that bridge when we came to it. I appreciate that. All right, members, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see then um, when the Minister brings that forward. As we all know, we would be keen for that, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, I'm sure if there's any indication, we'll get that through SharePoint or there'll be indications to be sent through as soon as possible. Um, members, moving then now to page five of your pack, you have been provided with correspondence in relation to the forthcoming betting, gaming, lotteries and amusements amendment bill. The department had offered a very late briefing at today's meeting um, in the event that we were going out for an early call for evidence. However, um, and this will apply to any welfare reform legislation, the Speaker is unlikely to receive legal advice on the competence of this bill until the end of July. So we will not be taking the briefing today and have instead scheduled it for the first meeting after recess on the 9th of September. And members, any comments or are you content to note? No. Thank you. Um, members, then, we're, we're moving on through just the, the chairperson's business. Um, you'll recall um, that we received training on questioning and techniques earlier um, in this year. Do you wish to receive a refresher of that training at some point in the autumn? Any comments? Sounds good. Yeah. I think if there's any opportunity to improve ourselves, it's always worthwhile taking. So that will be a yes, and we'll leave that for the team to organise. Um, members, Paula was contacted by Cooperation Ireland with regard to concerns they have over funding for the National Citizen Citizenship Service Programme. The funding comes from DFC. Um, have members any comments, or are members agreed that we write to the department to query the ongoing funding of the programme? Happy to write to the department, Chair. Okay, thank you, Karen. Anybody else have anything? So we're content to write if we don't hear. Just shout out, folks, because I'm sitting round not at the chair's desk at the moment. Um, I'm round at one of the members' seats. So if you've if you've raised your hands, I apologise. I won't be able to hear. So Andy, if you just go on ahead and call out. Um, so at that stage, then I'll take that that the <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the committee's happy that we write to the department to create the ongoing funding of the programme. Then we'll move now to agenda item three, which is the draft minutes at page 36. Um, so the members of the draft minutes and meeting on the 1st of July 2021 at page 36. Are you content to agree the minutes of the 1st of July as drafted? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item 4, page 47. Members, you have been provided at page 47 with a reply from DERA in relation to neighbourhood renewal. DARE officials are continuing to work closely with DFC and DFI to develop a funding package for rural regeneration. It is hoped that this work will come to a conclusion in the coming weeks. Members, have you any comments or are you content to note? Uh, 
I'll have a comment actually just while I'm in the chair. Um, I would be keen to see an outcome of that conclusion um, because I don't know at this stage if the differential between two and a half, uh, population of 2,500 to 5,000 is being included in that. So I would suggest that um, we may be right to Dara to say thank you very much for working on that and if this committee could receive sight or receive a copy of their concluding outcome um, once it's received, because if there is a gap, it means then that we have part of our community that are not entitled to apply for any funding. Are members content with that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Members, um, we're going to do a bit of jumping about um, in our pack because um, there's two items in relation to advice and I and it would be useful if we took those together. So um, if you want to turn first of all to page 123, 123 please. Um, this is the departmental response in relation to allocations to advice NI. Almost one million of funding has been awarded for 21-22 and a formal letter of offer and grant funding agreement has been sent to advice NI. This includes a six month advance payment released in April prior to sign off of the budget of almost £140,000 to ensure continuity of service. Members, you've also been provided at page 48 with a reply from Advice NI in relation to funding. The response states that the situation regarding welfare reform funding has been difficult over the past number of months and that the amount of funding in the budget equates to, one, to a 1.5 million reduction in funding to the independent advice sector. Advice NI state that despite assurances given publicly by the Minister, the content of the DFC Equality Impact Assessment cast doubt on welfare reform funding, and this was heightened as Advice NI entered the 21-22 financial year, with no contract forthcoming for 45 posts, including for Advice NI helpline staff and staff employed by the local frontline advice providers. Advice NI states that it had no choice but to issue protective redundancy notices given the fact that no contract had been received. Monthly protective notices have had to be issued to effective staff for the months of April, May and June. Advice NI's focus now is getting on with the work and engaging with the Department to ensure welfare reform funding and all other funding from the Department is sustained on a three-year basis from next year as opposed to the one-year approach, which breeds uncertainty and does not assist with longer-term planning. Members, have you any comments or are you content to note? Content to note. Um, Members, if I may, I would like to suggest that we write in support to our minister. Um, the minister, to be honest, many ministers have said that they want multi-year budgets. And um, I think it would be useful if we wrote to our minister and just said that we've received this information from Advice NI. We are in support of their call for a three-year um, basis. And, of course, support the minister in her seeking a multi-year budget um, to support organisations, including Advice NI, who are supporting her work to provide um, advice to the general public. But I think it would also be useful for us to write to the Minister for Finance to provide him with the response that we've received from Advice NI to further his proof of the need of multi-year budgets. You never know, it might help with the evidence that he provides to Treasury. Um, it's just that we have very capable and successful advice service workers um, who are now on protective notice. Having worked in the community and voluntary sector, being in that position undermines who you are and the work that you do, um, and it makes for a very difficult workplace. Um, and fair play to the advice workers because they have been amazing throughout the pandemic. The surge in people using universal credit or moving to universal credit has been unprecedented. Members, would you be content if we send those notes off to the two ministers? Chair, can I just come on there? Yes, please. Come um, I, I, I concur with everything that you're saying. I also commend the work of the independent advice sector and um, uh, agree with advice and I. Uh, and I suppose across many, many of the community and voluntary sectors, they're, they're in the same position in terms of protective notice. I totally agree with the multi annual uh, budget as well. And at once we're writing to both of them, uh, Chair, maybe write to the executive. Um, we know that that was 
the hope um, this year, particularly for the uh, communities minister, um, she wanted to do that but wasn't able to. Um, so we would like to see that going forward in relation to all the funded organisations. And um, I know I know how all the other ministers are of the same mind as well. But um, I, I would just agree with you, Chair, if we, if we write and just uh, send on the advice in a note as well. Thank you. I think that's a fair point well made, Karen, because I think we all know that ministers would love to have multi-year budgets because it would make, it actually makes for more efficiency savings and it makes for more certainty. Um, are members content with that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, members. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, actually, should we reply to Advice NI just to say to them to thank them for their response and um, to pass on the committee's um, encouragement for th in the work that they do and our thanks to all of their staff and that we appreciate the fact that they are on protective notice but still continue to deliver such a valuable service to the community. Would members be happy with that? Yeah, agreed, Chair. Are they still on protective notice? Sure, I've just, yeah. uh, I think, uh, to be honest, Mark, you're right. Yeah. I think that it's not the protective notice we have indications that that seems to have gone through. It was April, May and June. Yeah. Now that that yeah. forward payment has been made, I believe that the protective uh -huh. notice has gone. So maybe the, uh, the letter, you're right, would be amended to say that we appreciate the work that they did while they were on protective notice. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Fair point. And it also would be a sort of the, the whole situation of the single year budgets and if people are in this sort of situation, or like they suspend it almost for three months, where they they aren't in the contract, they're on the protective notice, and that's happening every year. You fear is there at some stage that there'll be a boy who cried wolf sort of situation as well, where you know at some stage, and hopefully it won't be ever for the independent advice sector, but there'll be some program there where where people won't seek further employment or whatever just because they think oh this always happens and it will get sorted out in the end and it won't so yeah. definitely the multi-year budgets is the, the, the way to go and i know we're writing to the executive and looking to help the, the finance minister and the executive in their arguments for this but i wonder might there be some merit then in terms of, of compiling correspondence from the multitude of groups, be it in the independent advice sector, like the community and voluntary sector, who do such vital and valuable work, who are adversely impacted by this. So the people in England who actually make the decision on this and have, have denied us the opportunity to move the multi-year budgets uh, to, to, to date, that they see it's not just politicians crying for us, <laughs> you know, it's, it's people and, and, and the supposed practical outworkings of not having uh, multi-year budgets. Um, I think that maybe would be too much for our committee to do, but we can, we can maybe even with, through our own communications with the community and voluntary sector ask them for information. Um, yeah. Perhaps that's something we should revisit in se September uh, with NICFA, I would suggest. Um, yes. that we maybe put it on for a forward work plan um, for that type of I evidence. I was trying to give us more work, Chair, don't worry. <laughs> I have to say, just on a personal note, um, of the 16 years I worked in, in the community and voluntary sector, I think that there was one period of two years where I had more than a one-year contract of employment. I have to say, see when you're trying to get a mortgage and you've only got a one-year contract, that has wider implications for a person's life. So um, it does cause yeah. difficulties. Yeah. But, um, yeah, same chair. I think the only time that I had a longer than a year was a period that we had funding through the big lottery. Um, but remember all those pressures and as Mark said, you know, um, maybe it's planning for because we know that March will quickly come round and we know come Christmas, December, that's when staff again are put on protective notice. So when the committee comes back in September, there's only a couple of months. So um, it's just raising that again, that uh, I suppose it's a vital issue and concern um, for the sectors and if, if it can be, I suppose help put a wee bit more pressure on um not that i know everybody is willing because they know it's the best way of working so i concur with mark as well thank you chair no problem thank you very sure. much sorry yes sure uh could, could, could it just uh, support that i think what uh, mark has got a, a good and valid point that uh, there are a lot of people out there uh, that have been hurting and i think like 
uh, the, a, a number of the other uh, issues that we've dealt with at committee. Uh, in the aftermath, we have known that the, the, the minister has been uh, uh, championing a lot of uh, a, a lot of these causes. No matter of fact, when she came into church, um, multi-year funding was one of the things that she said she wanted to, uh, to, to, to go towards. But she understands coming from a back, back background herself. So any support and any help that the minister can get uh, the push pressure, uh, good pressure, uh, not only uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the executive, but uh, uh, from the individual parties uh, to try and ensure uh, that this feature is highly up there uh, because it can, can be quite depressing and the sector has lost very valuable people uh, who took years and years uh, of training to, to, to bring them to a point. So I, I do think uh, that wherever we can, uh, we should bring pressure to uh, bear. Uh, and uh, I think what we should do is uh, uh, also, when we're writing off to the minister or the executive, or especially the minister, let them know that, uh, that, that we have her back in this here and want her support her. And, uh, and, 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 uh, 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 and introducing uh, uh, the multi year fund. Absolutely right, Fred. Um, as we all know, it's not just the duty of a committee to scrutinise, but also to act to support a minister where appropriate. And I think we can all agree this is one area where we're all of one voice um, that we do need support for multi year budgets. Um, thank you very much, members. I know that sort of ate into a wee bit of our time, but um, I think that was very appreciated. And I hope that any of the advice sector workers or the advice organisations out there can hear that we do support them and we thank them very much for their work. Members, moving on now, um, page 67, you have a departmental response in relation to the use of joint bank accounts for the future method of payment project. That's difficult to say. Um, so just page 67, customers without access to a bank account can opt to have benefits and pensions paid into the nominated account of a partner, family member or close friend if permission from the account holder has been given and an agreement has been made on how the money deposited is to be used. Any adjustments that need to be made to the amount a customer receives or recovery of an overpayment of benefit or pension will be completed by the department before the payment is released to the nominated account. The department follows existing guidance from the Health and Social Care Trusts and will investigate any suspicion or evidence of financial abuse or where neglect is, suspe is suspected. Um, members, I know this is something that I had brought up as a committee member. Um, it was concerns of any deductions being taken out of a, a carer's bank account, um, and that appears to be answered. Members, are you content to note or if you have any comments. No, can we note, uh, Chair? Sure. Yeah, content to note, thank you. Um, members, then moving to page 69, there's a departmental response in relation to allocations to the draft programme for government. A programme for government framework, uh, or sorry, the Apologies. A programme for government draft outcomes framework based on nine outcomes of societal wellbeing was recently consulted on and responses are now being analysed. <clears throat> the new programme for government will be brought forward by the First and Deputy First Minister for Assembly consideration in due course. It is intended that this will be a live web-based programme with progress monitored in order to ensure that actions are kept fresh and responsive to changing needs, priorities and challenges. Work on action plans is scheduled to commence in autumn 2021, initially linking to COVID recovery plans. The Department will be in a position to brief the Committee on the proposed programme for government actions once it reaches this stage of the process. Members, are you content to note or any comments? Just say content. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Moving on now to um, page 70. And it's the departmental response in relation to women's aid refuges. And res the response states that the distri distribution of women's aid refuges is now based on need, and the minister understands that a refuge service is now provided in Newry. The Northern Ireland Housing Executive has advised that women's aid should present it with new refuge pr proposals. In addition to supporting people funding, the Neighbourhood Renewal Investment Fund has provided an allocation of 400,000 um, capital funding to foil women's aid. Um, members, <coughs> have you any comments or are you content to note and forward a copy to Dolores Kelly, MLA? Yeah. 
I'll move forward on to Dolores then. Yep. Thank you yeah, very yeah. much. Members, you've been provided at page 72 with the departmental response in relation to the High Street Task Force. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, members. I have a frog in my throat. I think I talked myself hoarse earlier this week. Um, following the plenary or the next plenary meeting of the task force, the chairs have indicated that issues identified will be basis for comprehensive engagement with stakeholders in accordance with the outputs agreed by ministers. The department is aiming to have the High Street Tax Task Force report with recommendations completed by March 2022. The, de the departmental reply also contains a joint response between DFC and the Executive Office in answer to the questions from Assembly Research Paper. This is found at Annex A. <coughs> Excuse me. Members, have you any comments or are you content to note? <coughs> content to note. Content. Thank you very much. Um, mem members, you've been provided at page 122 with a departmental response in relation to allocations to gender budgeting. The department's budget process is informed by the Section 75 considerations and therefore already includes a gender perspective. All departments complete an equality screening on their draft budget outcome, and those screenings or full equality impact assessments, if required, are considered by the executive in the final deliberations on the budget. Members, before I come to you for comment or uh, to ask if you're content to note, I have to say this is one of the, the, the issues with gender budgeting. Section 75 is used to confirm that people have not been discriminated against. It's not used proactively to ensure that people are receiving or groups of people are receiving enhancements to improve equity. Um, I'm not content with this response. Um, I think that there is a need for departments to consider, con, or sorry, consider gender budgeting, and that was agreed on International Women's Day uh, following a motion in the House all parties took part in. Um, so, members, I'm going to ask if you would um, be content if we ask the women's, I think it's called the Women's Gender Budgeting Group, um, come forward to ourselves at some stage in the future. Um, to outline what gender budgeting is and what interaction they have had with the Department of Finance and our department um, regarding gender budgeting being used as a tool for planning future budgets. Are you, would you be happy with that or any other comments? Great. Yes, yeah, agreed. Thank you very much. I think it's important that we, we push this because gender budgeting is not just about women, it's about everyone in society. Um, so that will be for future, obviously, way after... Um, all of the work that we have coming up in the autumn. <laughs> um, members, you've been provided at page 124 with a department letter, departmental letter in relation to Social Security health assessments. Um, we know that there has been quite a lot of chat in media today about that. This letter states that since her appointment in 2020, Minister Hargey has made clear that her policy decision is for the reversal of Social Security privatisation and a return to in-house health assessments. Options to bring the full service in-house immediately were examined by the department. However, an appraisal determined that these would be reliant on a partnership delivery approach with the Department of Health. It was determined that a George. partnership. George, uh, you Oh, sorry. It was determined that a partnership with the Department of Health is not currently feasible. The independent audit of cases will be brought in-house from August 2021 to provide a more robust oversight and scrutiny of the quality of service provided. Members, have you any comments or are you content to note? And I'm going to open the floor just um, to anyone that wants to come in on this. Sure, i here. Thank you. There are significant concerns in relation to PIP and I appreciate the Minister's correspondence in relation to um, the steps that she's taken and clearly there needs to be further steps taken in relation to the safeguarding of claimants going through the medical assessment process. I'm sure we could all um, present uh, cases where we've had horror stories of the, the process for vulnerable individuals going through the assessment process. Therefore, I would like to put it out to the committee that we give consideration to the establishment of a public inquiry to examine all of this, because I myself has, have significant concerns and I feel that uh, it's incumbent upon us as a committee to investigate this further. Any other comments? 
Yeah, Chair, if that's a proposal from, from Andy, I'd be uh, happy to, to support that. I, I mean, I take it face value, certainly, that the, the Minister's commitment as laid out in, in this letter and, and they know her intention of what she wants to do and I think that ties in with what a lot of us would want to do in the direction of travel we would want to take. But just our Chair, Kelly, I think it was last July you got an answer back from the Minister and in fairness I think it was the Interim Minister at that time who said that the cap of that contract would be extended <laughs> beyond 2021 for another two years. Which it doesn't just suggest to me, it tells me that the decision had been made more than a year before the expiry of this contract, that the decision had been taken to extend it. I, I, I think that's incredible, to be quite frank. And I know we were in COVID times and, and, and crazy times, but to, to make that decision a full 12 months beforehand without exploring what other options there were, even about going out to tender again. I'm not talking about trying to use that year to get everything in house because we know that's going to take a long time and, and, and a lot of work. But uh, there's something that there's just something not quite right about it all, I think. Thank you. Members, um, I'm, I'm going to be realistic on this one. Um, we're expecting three bills to come forward to this committee in the autumn. Um, that will, you saw with the liquor licence and how busy this committee can become. If this is something that the committee is committed to look into, to go through an inquiry, um, just to, to let you know now that this will probably mean us meeting twice a week in order to deal with an inquiry as well. Um, so just to put that in front of members. So members, we've had a proposal and a second for this committee to carry out an inquiry. No, I thought it was a public inquiry. Oh, a public inquiry. Sorry, a public inquiry. Oh, I'll need to check that. It's not a committee inquiry then. Could Andy please just restate Andy, yes. what he was looking for there? Sorry, uh, in the first instance, a committee inquiry, but if, if that's not feasible, then we look at a public inquiry and, and, and how we go about bringing that um, to fruition. Um, can sure. I don't know if I can <laughs> propose something here, but um, it might be something that we bring to um, the first committee meeting back to have a, a think through. Um, we could do a, a, a short session um, thinking at once people have had time to weigh that up. Members, um, so what has sure. been... Sorry, go on ahead. Sure. Sure, and, uh, I, I, and uh, again, I understand uh, the, the, what, what Andy is saying, uh, but we need to be careful about jumping into something we know not, absolutely nothing about. I think that uh, the, the advice uh, that, this, that we deal with this at the first meeting back, when we have all the information at hand uh, and that are, are able to uh, we move it forward, everybody uh, is in agreement that uh, that uh, the, the the administration of PEP has been abysmal. And I, but if we're going to do something, at least let's do it on the best possible advice and information. So the proposal then, members, is that um, Andy has put forward and Mark has seconded about an inquiry. Well, we're just clar clarifying. Sure, on the back of, sure, sorry, on the back of what I've said there and on the back of what uh, the, 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 the committee clerk has said, uh, the, would they be willing to wait that's until what I was, such time that we have all the information? That's what I was just about to say, Fra. So um, we've had a proposal through from Andy and seconded by Mark for an inquiry. However, what type of inquiry is something that has yeah. been brought forward? Is it a committee inquiry or a public inquiry? We know that in-house the minister um, is... Um, the independent audit of cases, for instance, is coming in house from August 2021. I think we're all in agreement and we all have very sound evidence coming through our, of, our office of PIP um, and there are concerns there. But the proposal on the table is that rather than, than moving to immediately go to an inquiry from September when we come back, that we have a meeting first to look at the type of inquiry and the potential of what we can do, what we will need to do, and then we can take a decision on the way forward from that. That's not to say that we won't do an inquiry, it's just in September that we look at it again um, to ensure that we, as Fra says, that um, we consider all the implications for that. Um, just, just to make sure that, to be honest folks, 
let's be clear here, we have a lot of people who are saying that they have been harmed by this process. We don't want to mm -hmm. add to that harm. Yeah. Um, so are members content then at the first meeting, meeting in September um, that we discuss this item again? And we asked the clerks if they could provide us with information as to ways forward um, and to seek from the department um, clarification mm -hmm. on what they're doing um, to make sure that we have all the evidence in front of us for our first meeting back in September um, so that we can consider if we will be taking forward. Uh, sorry, Alex, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just another, um, I, I'm happy to wait to September, but um, you know, we do need to do something about it. But maybe another way to, to think about this in September is maybe a committee motion to the Assembly. And we, we could call for a public inquiry that way as well. So it's, it's just yeah. something else to think about. That could you know. be one of the outcomes that we decide then, certainly in September. Yeah. So, Andy and Mark, rather than than ignoring your proposal in your second, are you content then that we wait to the first meeting in September? We take in that meeting a lot more evidence about what is happening, what we as a committee can do and can do yeah. to help, to be honest, um, uh, because it will be out of our hands if it's a public inquiry um, and it may not, our request may not ever go anywhere. Um, we would rather do something that's effective. So are you happy with yeah. that proposal? I'd be uh, content enough to wait as well. Chair, <laughs> it depends what, what we're waiting on. You know, it's fine to get the information about what's happening and what the plans are. You know, and the step by step, I suppose, plan of, of how we're going to bring it in house. But I'm also very keen to hear what happened. But, you know, how, why, and when was it decided to extend Capita's contract? When, when we're all agreed around this table or virtual table, how? awful they have been, not just how awful at doing the job that they're paid very well to do, but how awful they've been to people, you know, and how, how the distress that they've caused. Uh, when was the decision taken that the contract would be extended? What options were looked at in that regard? Uh, you know, we, we need to know that. I think we've had replies in the past. Yeah, we've had some replies in the past with regards to that, Mark, but I think what we can do <coughs> is in September is we'll collate all that together. We, we, we have had replies, uh, Chair, but, but, but never with, with that sort of real detail of information. Like I say, you got an answer to a, a written question last July yeah. saying that the contract was going to be extended. I got about three or four answers between then and, and last month saying that oh, it was being considered or that the Minister didn't know what was happening. That's after telling you that it was being extended. So uh, there's just something that doesn't quite add up, add up to me. I'm not blaming necessarily the Minister, but, but, but where in the department what was look, or who was responsible for looking at this within the department? Yeah. I think we'll get all that advice and bring that together for September. Sorry, Karen, I, I cut across you there. No, you're great, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not opposing what uh, Mark or, or Andy is coming on with, but I suppose as, as someone who campaigned for many years against ATOS and then Capita, I think the evidence is there we clearly see in terms of the flawed system. For me, I would like to see a, a detailed response from the Department now in relation to the recommendations that came out the implementation of the recommendations that came out of the audit report last week. We know the minister has um, committed um, to uh, uh, you know take it on board the recommendations that she has with the Marie Kavanagh recommendations report. Um, but it would be very much you know what action is going to be taken, what's the time frame, uh, when are we likely uh, to see that moving along. Um, we, we obviously welcome um, the commitment from the Minister to bring this in the House, um, but I suppose the difficulty is it's not just down to her department, um, health as well, so there's there's definitely commitments there around time frame and, and, and getting this implemented in the House as soon as possible um, and, and then, you know, bringing down the end the capita contract. So that, that's just a wee bit more detail I would like to see uh, as well. And I'm not sure that that needs to do with the September chair. So that's a proposal I'm putting forward as well. Yes, we can certainly get that sort of info. That's the type of information, Karen, that we need um, as a committee to look at um, for our decision making in September. Um, members, I think that's us sort of decided we're going to revisit this um, very early on in September. And I would like to make it clear for all those who are listening in, this committee 
is committed to improving the lives and well-being of people out there. We are aware of the issues. We are considering the issues. It's not like we're taking a summer recess and nothing happens. There will be a lot of information requested and brought forward for our committee. Any information will be provided to us in our SharePoint. And at our meeting back at the, uh, the start of September, we will be considering whether or not we're going to take forward a, a committee inquiry or call for a public inquiry into, the, into CAPITA and PIP. And um, we will be taking evidence on that. Um, this is a very serious issue. It has been a serious issue for all members of the committee over the last period of time. We haven't been ignoring it. We have been asking the minister. The minister has reacted by saying that she's looking to bring in house the services. But what we want to make sure is that under TIPI, the staff that are brought in house to deliver that service and the service that is being delivered is changed in a way that it recognises people with disabilities and their needs. Um, so thank you very much for that, members. Um, it's going to be a big work for us sure. to do. <laughs> thank you. Yes, sorry, Andy. Sure. I just want to come back in on the point, uh, and I appreciate the Minister's desire to bring um, the medical assessments in-house, but we need to be realistic here. That is going to take a significant period of time in order to properly resource um, and bring about the medical assessors required to bring um, this service in-house. So we need to make sure that the medical assessment system under capita, or what the alternative may be, is adequate, um, because it's not going to happen overnight. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that you're stating that, but I think we just need to be clear with people out there on, on the ground that bringing it in house will not happen overnight, even if that is the desire. Absolutely, Andy. No, you're you're right. That's that's not what it was. Supplied. But we have to remember those medical people are medically qualified. It may be yeah. the process that they are asked to go through is what it's at fault, and that will include DWP. One of our considerations, of course, will be if we. Um, move away from the DWP questions and the DWP forms, what impact will that have for Northern Ireland? Um, so there's a lot for us to consider and we'll do that in September. Um, thank you very yeah. much. Um, just, just, just one more point here to consider. It's maybe because capita are so bad <laughs> and the report laid that out you know, and confirmed what most of us already knew. A lot of the focus, certainly, of, of the media and again of us today has been on Capita and their performance. But I think the department are getting away in the smoke a wee bit because the report <laughs> didn't exactly uh, cast them in a good light uh, either in terms of, of, of fulfilling the, their departmental duties. They were basically letting Capita mark the, the, their own homework. And, and, and stuff like, like that. So I think we need to consider that too, even when we're talking about bringing things in house. But we have to look at where the shortcomings have been within the department as well as as well as within Capita. Thank you, Mark. Sure. Yes. Sure. See, uh, uh, just, uh, just, uh, just on the back of what Mark has said, there, I think that uh, uh, if we're moving towards this, what we need to look at is, is uh, the whole picture. And I uh, remember uh, the 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 and where every bit is bought uh, is uh, the Lexi Eight cost. So it needs to be taken in how they how they were brought in, uh, the the arguments against them being brought in, and uh, the way that that whole run. So I think what we need to do if we're going to do that, we need a discussion on finding out how the privatisation of the service happened in the first place. Yeah, and we can see who who voted for it and against it. Thank you very much, members. Certainly. This is a. Sure, can I just clarify one final point in, uh, in release, and I'll, I'll not press on any more on this. The, the, the paper in September, will that be an options paper to look at the, the potential for a committee inquiry, uh, the route for a public inquiry, uh, supported by the additional evidence that uh, colleagues have highlighted? It will be, Andy. It will be. Uh, and it will also hopefully lay out, by then we should have a, a clearer picture as well on the number of bills. We actually potentially have four bills. Oh we have charities bill that we're calling for evidence on over the summer. We'll have private tenancies hitting uh, the committee early September. And we'll have the gambling um, and lotteries legislation and also potentially the welfare reform. So um, we will have to bear everything in the round and have a potentially a closed session discussion on the ways forward for the committee in September. It looks like, folks, we will be living in this room um, from September um, to get through all that we need to get through. But, Andy, yes, the options paper will come forward in September um, and we'll consider that um, as the best way forward as well because um, while the committee has a lot of work, I think we're not, none of us are shy from any work, um, but it's 
we want to be able to give this an appropriate and fair hearing because that's only fair for the claimants who have been harmed um, and I think we're all in agreement on that so members I'm going to move on our chair has joined us Paula Bradley I'm just checking Paula if you want me to finish off this section or I, I can pick it up that's you can fine. pick up no problem so um, just page 10 at the bottom of here thank you very much members I'm very happy to hand over to our chair <laughs> Um, thank you, thank you, Kelly, for for chairing that, members. And um, then, if you're happy enough, we'll then move on. Um, so, uh, the sir, sir. go ahead. Sir, sir, can I make my apologies? I have to leave. All right, Frank. Um, uh, and uh, uh, sorry about that. But... No problem. All right, Frank. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Right. Okay, members. At a previous meeting, the committee agreed to write to all local councils regarding the VRS provision and to ask if they were aware of the number of deaf people living in their council area and if so how did they gather this information and is it gathered under community planning responses from eight councils have been received to date and these start at page 126 of your meeting pack. Um, Lisburn and Castlereagh City Council wish to highlight a few additional points although it does not currently operate a VRS it is conscious of the challenges faced by those who are deaf or who have a hearing in Permanent and has measures in place. For example, all council videos for social media are subtitled. Uh, there's providing of hearing loops in public buildings and providing a sign language interpreter on request. Um, members, can I ask if you any comments you wish to make on that, uh, on any of that uh, detail that was provided from the councils around VRS? Go ahead, Kelly. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm glad to be back to being an ordinary committee member now. I was just going to say, I'm a wee bit disappointed, and that this just shows, and we know ourselves, um, that there isn't a standardised approach to provision of accessible um, communications across our councils. And while some are trying, um, that, uh, that standardisation approach is, is the issue. Um, I'm wondering if we could write to um, the officials that are looking after the disability strategy to ask them if they are considering a standardisation model for accessible communications um, for all public bodies across Northern Ireland to ensure that, that all our citizens have access to their to communications. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good idea. Any other members want to make any comment or content to note and go with that proposal? Intent? Okay. And then I just then want to move on. Um, members at a previous meeting, the committee agreed to write to all councils again to ask for details on burial grounds regulations, how they have been dealing with the regulations, and for details of their policies on burials. Uh, responses from seven councils have been received to date, and these start at page 161 of your pack. In addition to the responses, the Environmental Health Manager, again from Lisburn and Castlereagh Borough Council, highlighted several points. They're saying that current burial regulations require a coffin to be placed no less than 70 centimetres from the level of any ground adjoining the grave. He suggested that this could be reduced to at least 50 centimetres. And in relation to um, 16, the minimum fine is £100. This should be reviewed in line with other similar fines on conviction and references to RUC should be updated to reflect PSNI. Um, members, any comments on this? I know, Alex, this was something you had brought up. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I, I don't know what other members have experienced, but in, in Ards and North Down, it's been quite horrendous. Um, People been told to come bury loved ones like a day before the burial, even though it's all been organised, and it's just caused absolute havoc. And it's it's hurtful, and it's something that um, Kelly would probably support me on. But um, you just don't want to put families through, and and I don't understand that sometimes. You know, you're talking maybe a couple of centimetres, and they're being so petty, and there doesn't seem to be any leeway with some of the councils. And we see some some of the, the the answers back. You know, they would like to see a, a bit of a review of what's what's going on. Um, so um, I'm probably not going to be on the committee when we get back for September, unfortunately. So. Um, th this is something that's very important to me, and, and I'm hoping the committee will back me, but I would have loved to have seen the committee, if agreeable, to maybe doing a committee uh, motion on this subject, because this this does need addressed, and, and so far the, the Communities Department um, has just ignored the public petition and um, is ignoring the pain and hurt that's being caused out there on a regular basis. 
Um, and, and I would love, and I would hope the committee would maybe back me if we could consider doing a committee motion um, when we get back. Um, I'll, I'll let other members come in, but it's, it's really, really important to me, and I just hope the members realise how much this means to me to get something done as possible. No, I know that. Thank you for that, Alex. And I know I'd, I'd highlighted it in this committee before that my own local council that I live in um, had mentioned that they actually take a common sense approach to all of this. Um, and it, it is actually good to note that Lisbon and Castlereagh Council have suggested that it should be at least 50 centimetres and not 70 centimetres. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I have no issues in, in going forward if the committee want to revisit this again as part of our planning in September. Um, to look at a, a committee motion um, to ask that the Minister review um, the regulations around this. I do not have a difficulty with that. Uh, Kelly, did you want to come in there? Yes, thank you. Um, I was just thinking there is a review going into councils at the moment, going through communities. Um, I'm not sure if the public call, sorry, I'm just I'm not sure if the public call has gone out for um, responses as yet, but I think it may well be something that we have a method to actually go back through to ask for those amendments, you know, for a review and for the amendments. Um, so I think that maybe we could ask the department if their current review of councils intends to look at, at this type of detail, and if it is, then can they um, review for that uh, with the considerations that has been brought forward. As Alex has said, I know in our own um, council area um, it has been extremely emotional, very negative impact on families. Very, very distressing, to be honest, for anybody who's been involved in that. Um, I don't know why notification wasn't given to um, families after the the last burial that had gone in that was within, you know, before you know, to say to those families, that's it, that that grave's full. Um, it seems to be very haphazard. Um, I know that the super councils had come in, and and it just has been so tough. Um, Funerals and burials of loved ones is difficult enough, but then to be told that families can't be buried together is heartbreaking, especially if the families didn't know in advance. But I'm just wondering if we could write to the department to ask them, are they going to consider things like the council burial ground regulations um, along with their council review um, to see if we can change it through that? Okay, I think that in the first instance is, is probably a good idea. Um, I, uh, if we can get the, an answer on that, that will let us know then how we, we intend to proceed. Um, because it is, it's a really emotive issue for many families out there, and um, yeah, it, 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 I, I certainly, as I said, my own council uses a common sense approach, which I think that all councils should be using across the board, um, because especially at, at those times in people's lives when emotions are so so um, high, and they're going through that grief. Um, so, Alex, are you happy enough with that? We'll, we'll write and ask that first, and then if, when we get that answer back in September, the committee then can decide as to what way they proceed on that. Can't hear you. Yes, Chair. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy enough at the moment. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. Look, thank you for that. Um, I've just forgotten where I am. There we go. Okay, members are going to move on then. At a previous meeting, the committee agreed to write to all Northern Ireland universities and further education colleges to ask if they offer a housing degree, and if not, why the option was dropped, and if there are any plans to introduce it. You'll see a response from all but, all but Queen's University, starting at page 284. Are members any comments? Are they content to note? Content. Yep. Content. Yes. Okay. All right, members, in your table papers, you have been provided with a departmental reply in re relation to changing places. The 2021-22 Access and Inclusion Programme closed on the 23rd of June, and 69 applications were received, including six seeking support towards the installation of changing places facilities. All applications will now be assessed by a moder moderation panel. Um, if, following the assessment stage, there is an underspend, the Department will seek further applications from councils and the Northern Ireland Museums Council to ensure that the programme budget is allocated in full. Again, members, any comments? Are they content to note that correspondence? Kelly? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you know what? I'm a wee bit disappointed that not all councils have taken the opportunity to apply for a changing places toilet. It would be useful. Um, you know, we have six have sought support. Um, 69 applications is quite good, but if, if the fact is that 
if you need to go to the bathroom, you need to go to the bathroom and you don't have to travel across council areas to be able to get to a changing places toilet. I'd be quite keen to ask the department if they confirm um, if all, if, are they, have they contacted all councils to remind them about the money and to, um, to apply um, and get it spent? Right, no, that's fair enough. Um, anybody else want to make comment on this? Chair, if I could just come on, I suppose um, uh, on the back of that, is, it's also as well, you know, all new builds, like I'm thinking there's a number of new community centres being built here in my constituency, uh, there should be a change in uh, places facility, uh, and them included, we shouldn't have any new builds coming forward without um, uh, those such facilities now in place, I uh, just wanted to put that on the record as well, thank you Chair. Thanks for that, Karen. I remember there was some discussion sure. around that, around any plant new planning. Um, regulations. Yeah, changes to building regulations. Did that come? Did that come through? Can it's, anybody remember? It's through um, Department of Finance, yeah. um, and I believe that the wonderful Christine McClements has been working with the minister, and there will be that requirement in all new public buildings. Yeah. But I don't think that's passed yet. Yeah, because yeah, I, I remember working on this issue when I was um, in health many, many years ago, and um, you know there were many parents were saying, you know, the likes even of, of any hotels being built that with with rooms and hotels that had changing places facilities, like they would get the tourism, they would get the utilisation of those things, and it just it it's just I suppose we, we need to just get that message out there that there are many families that require changing places and they, you know they're not included in part of the market of the greater tourism uh, market as well here in Northern Ireland. Andy, did you want to come in? Yeah, sure. It's just on that, that point um, in relation to the technical, technical guidance on the building regulations and I've been in correspondence with the Finance Minister previously on this and it said they'd hope to uh, bring this forward towards the end of the year and conclude it before the end of the mandate and I'm just wondering if uh, colleagues are in agreement that we write to the Finance Minister and see if we can get a more definitive timeline on that. Okay, yep, we can do that, absolutely. Any other comments, members? Okay, content we move on, yes? Yeah. Okay. All right, members, uh, in your table papers, you've been provided with a request to brief from the chair of the panel for the independent review of discretionary support. Um, if members are content to be briefed at the meeting on the 16th of September, agreed? Agreed. Yeah? Okay. Then I'm going yeah. to move... Sorry, did somebody want to say something there? Oh, no, sorry, I was just... No, okay. Agreeing. No bother. All right, I'll move on to agenda item five, which is the charities bill. Members, you've been provided at page 289 with a draft motion to extend the committee stage of this bill until the 10th of December 2021. This extension acknowledges that we will have two other bills that will likely be at committee stage also in the autumn, so we need to allow ourselves some flexibilities to provide time in meetings to deal with the early parts of the committee stages of those other bills also. Um, while also taking oral evidence on the Charities Bill. Can I ask members, are they content to agree the motion that it be lodged with the Business Office? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, the advert for the public call for evidence will be in the usual press on Wednesday the 14th of July. Um, you may see a call for evidence on the committee's website slightly before that date. And we have had requests this week from two individuals to be sent the departmental papers the committee considered at its meeting last week. Um, those papers were the NICFA and Edwards and Company submissions received by the department and provided to the committee with their agreement. A breakdown of regulatory decision uh, which the bill will make lawful and details concerning the number of registration decisions that were appealed, their criteria for an appeal and the number of appeals that were upheld in terms of decisions being lawful. Um, members, these papers will be published in due course as part of the evidence in the committee report on the bill. However, other options are to publish the papers on the committee's website, on the call for evidence web page once this is launched, or to issue the individuals on request. Um, members just want to seek your views on this. Um, I do note that the, certainly the one from um, Edwards and Company was received by the department and provided the committee with their agreement. So I just um, want to see what your views on that. Uh, or would you be content that we that we as a committee just uh, in due course publish that um, uh, uh, as we go along, or do you think that we should send out those papers to the two 
um, people that have written to us for that. Anybody, any opinion on that? Sure, I have no objections to providing those papers. You'd said they belong to NICFA and um, one other. Um, as long as they're content with that, I, I see no issue with them being provided. We can ask that. Okay, no, that's fair enough. I mean, it, it's up to us as a committee to decide what we want to do with that. Go ahead, Kelly. Chair, I'm not sure if we can provide everything that's been asked for. Details concerning the number of registration decisions that were appealed and criteria for appeal and the number of appeals wouldn't be for this. I don't know whether we have that. It might come up it's later. In, it's in the, it's the information that the department sent okay. uh, last week. It's just headline. It's numbers. It's not it's um, nothing else. It's um, not details of individual charities. There's no data breaches there. No. Uh, the only thing I would say is I've already been in receipt of um, queries from a number of individuals who have written to the committee over a period of time. And I think we just need to make it very clear that this is the departmental bill um, and we're investigating it. But as far as individual cases are concerned and complaints that they have, we can't get into the detail of, of what that complaint was or the decisions that were made, but we, we can accept people's evidence that they want to supply. Just would be worried that we would be drawn in, or some people might think that we have a way of overriding appeals when we don't. Yeah, and we'll go on to discuss that a little bit further in detail as we we'll go along. Um, so I just need to make a decision. Um, what about then that we ask the clerk to go and check if that information is ours to share, first and foremost? Do we have permission to share that information, first and foremost? And if we do, then um, would the members then agree that that is sent to the individuals that have asked for it? Is that a way forward? Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Everybody agreed? Agreed. Yeah. All right. Okay, members, um, in addition, an individual has requested to brief the committee on the Charities Bill. To take briefings from individuals places the committee in a difficult position, given the history of the legal matters that have led up to the need for the bill and the fact that the committee is taking the committee, is ta taking the committee stage of the bill and is not conducting an inquiry or an investigation into the actions or processes of the Charities Committee. Um, just to remind members of the other ongoing reviews running in parallel with this bill, which are dealing with the wider issues. Um, the independent review of the, the Charity Commission is looking at improvement to delivery of service and the operation of the regulatory framework for charities going forward. And the Charity Commission has appointed an independent council to conduct a review of complaints arising from the Commission's regulation of the charities Loch Ness Rescue Limited and Disabled Police Officers Association Northern Ireland. However, the experience of some individuals does mean they will have valid comments to make on the content of the bill. So I would propose that individuals submit evidence via our public call for evidence in the first instance, focusing on the clauses of the bill. And once the call for evidence, evidence closes, the committee can review responses and consider its options for further evidence from individuals if it's deemed necessary by the committee. I would reiterate that, uh, as Kelly had said earlier, we are being lobbied, all of us are being lobbied by individuals or groups that will be necessary, and it will be necessary for individuals responding to us to focus on the clauses of the bill and potential additions, amendments within the scope of the bill. So, members, we're all in the same position. Every one of us are being lobbied. Not There's nobody being lobbied more than anybody else, um, but we just have to be very careful around this. And as I say, it, it, we have to focus on, on the, the, this bill and the scope of this bill. So, um, are members content with that uh, those proposals going forward? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Chair sure, Andy here. Go ahead. Um, can, I declare an can I declare an interest as charity trustee? I should have done that at the outset. Um, okay. Remiss of me. Um, you know, I am content with, um, as has been outlined by yourself, Chair. Um, there's no doubt there are a number of individuals who will have significant knowledge and experience with the wider process, but as has been outlined, it needs to be uh, relevant to the particular clauses of the bill. So it's important that we provide every opportunity, which we do as a committee, uh, for stakeholders and individuals to provide evidence. So content with that. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Any other member want to make comment? Are we happy we move on? 
Okay, then we'll move on to tabled items again, which are a, a number of SL1s. Um, we've been uh, asked to consider six SL1s at our meetings today. Our meeting today. Um, and whilst we will consider these today, I'd like to put on record to the department that coming so late with so many SL1s is unsatisfactory and it does not give members much time to read the papers. Um, I would hope that post recess the department will endeavour to plan better and stick to the committee pack deadlines. Um, so members will just then move on to the first proposed rule. It is page nine of your table papers and is the occupation and, and personal pension schemes condition for transfer regulations Northern Ireland 2021. Um, the proposed rule sets out the conditions that must be satisfied for the different ways that trustees or managers of occupational personal pension schemes may permit a member of their scheme to use the cash equivalent value of respectively the member's accrued rights to benefits or pension credit rights so as to make a transfer of the value into another occupational personal pension scheme. Can I ask members have they any comments or are they content for the department to proceed to make this rule? Content. Content. Okay. I'll ask you to move on to page 14 of your table papers, which is SL1, Occupational Pension Schemes, Admin Investment Charges and Governance, Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. The proposed rule places administration and governance requirements on trustees of occupational defined contribution pension schemes in particular to require trustees of certain defined contribution pension schemes to disclose their investment returns and demonstrate that they are providing value for their members. It also increases flexibility for DC schemes to take account of performance fees payable to fund managers when calculating the cap on charges that applies to default investment arrangements. Again, members, any comments? Are they content for the department to proceed to make the rule? Content. Content. Thank you. I'll ask you to turn to page 19 of your table papers, SL1, Occupational Pension Schemes, Climate Change, Governance and Reporting, Miscellaneous Provisions and Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. The proposed rule will introduce requirements for trustees of certain occupational pension schemes to ensure there is effective governance of those schemes with respect to the effects of climate change. It also introduces related reporting and publication requirements for such trustees and confers new compliance powers on pensions regulator. Um, members, again, any comments or are they content? Are you content for the department to proceed to make the rule? Content. Content. Okay, moving then to page tw tw uh, 25 of table papers, SL1, Occupational Pension Schemes, Climate Change Governance and Reporting Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. The proposed rule will introduce requirements about trustee knowledge and understanding of matters relating to the effects of climate change on occupational pension schemes. The trustees here are subject to the climate change governance and reporting requirements. It also makes consequential amendments to existing regulations in relation to disclosure and notification requirements. Members, again, any comments or are you content for the department to proceed to make the rule? Content. Content. Thank you. Moving on then to page 31 of your table papers, SL1, Pensions Regulator, Information Gathering Powers and Modification Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. The proposed rule sets out the minimum information which the Pensions Regulator must include in a notice which requires a person to attend an interview under extended provisions introduced by the Pension Schemes Act 2021. It also modifies the regulator, regulator's extended inspection powers so they apply to multi-employer schemes and sets out the level of the fixed and escalating civil penalties. Again, members, any comments? Are you content for the department to proceed to make this rule? Content. content. Thank you. Moving on then to page 37 of your table papers, you'll see an SL1, the Pensions Regulator Employer Resources Test Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. The proposed rule sets out what constitutes the resources of the employer for the purposes of the employer resources test and sets out the basis for how the value of the resources of the employer is to be calculated, determined and verified. Again, members, any comments? Are you content for the department to proceed to make this rule? Content. content. Thank you. Moving on then to agenda item six, which is SR 2021-188, the Child Support Maintenance Calculation Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find a copy of the rule at page 295 of your pack. 
Um, members, we considered the SL1 at our meeting on the 24th of January. So can I ask, have members any objection to the rule? Sorry, excuse me, 24th right. of June. 24th June, of June, January. I don't know where I am here, sorry. Yeah, I'll read that again, that we considered the <laughs> SL1 on at our meeting on the 24th of June. <laughs> okay, can I ask members if you have any objections to the rule? No objections. No objections. Then I'll put the following, that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-188, the Child Support Maintenance Calculation Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objections to the rule. We'll move on to agenda item 7, which is SR 2021-190, the Housing Notifications of Disposals and Mortgages Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Um, members, a copy of the rule is at page 303. We considered this SL1 at our meeting on the 17th of June. Uh, again, can I ask members, have you any objection to the rule? No. Okay. Uh, put no. the following then, that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-190, the Housing Notifications of Disposal and Mortgages Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objections to the rule. Um, members, uh, just before we go to correspondence, um, I've just been notified here by the clerk that we need to take a very short break um, uh, for a, a, a correspondence needs to be done by the clerk um, with the department. So um, we'll take a short break now and we'll be back with you very soon. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. All right, members, we're going to move then on to agenda item eight, which is correspondence. Members, the correspondence memo is at page 312 of your packs. I want to draw your attention to page 576, which is an email from Boyle Bingo asking to brief the committee on a possible extension to the licensing bill to bingo halls. Um, members, um, as we are no longer in control of this uh, legislation, in fact, it's gone now to go and get royal assent. Can I then just uh, put forward that we forward uh, this correspondence to the department? Members in agreement? Agreed. Okay. Members then, page 577 is a letter from an individual regarding to the Sports Sustainability Fund. Again, members, are you content to forward this to the department for comment? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, and then at page 579 is a letter drafted by the Scottish Assembly's Committee for Social Justice and Social Security on the Universal Credit and Working Tax Credit Uplift for Committee Consideration. The Scottish Committee hopes to get all four relevant committees within all of other UK legislatures to jointly sign this letter to be issued to the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Secretary of State of Work and Pensions. Again, members, have you any comments or are you content for the letter uh, it, to be signed by our committee if all others are on board? Agreed. Agreed with that, members? Yes, okay, Agreed. thank you. All right, I'm going to ask, do any, other, any members want to bring anything else up under um, correspondence? No. No, nothing? All right, then I'll move on to agenda item nine, which is our forward work programme. Um, members, it is my intention that, that unless something very urgent um, comes up, this will be the last meeting until the 9th of September, as we are facing a very, aut a very busy autumn um, and winter with the bills that we have before us. Um, after recess, we will consider our forward work programme for the new term and following on from um, the meeting earlier today. Um, then there will need to be some sort of planning meeting will have to take place. So we'll just consult with members um, when we get to near the time, if they're happy enough with that. Um, let me see. Is there anything else I need to say on that part? No, I don't think so. Um, members, any comments they want to make on that to do with our forward work programme? Nothing? All right. Okay, then I'm going to move to any other business. Members, have has anybody got any other business they wish to highlight? Nothing? No. Nope. Thank you very much. Sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I was trying to get on there and for the work program, but I've kind of lost my way on my device here. No, it was just in terms of, of the anti-poverty strategy. Just wondering 
where it's at. You know, we we we'd seen the draft, but we got it along with the other strategies. We were kind of bombarded that day with lots of draft uh, strategies, but I'd be keen at some point for the committee to get an update on where that's at and maybe have input rather than from departmental officials, but from the expert panel or, or, or some representatives from the expert panel who'd, who'd been involved in the co-design of it. Mark, can I just ask you to repeat again which strategy it was? We kind of no, we picked it up there. Which one are you talking Sorry, about? Uh, the anti-poverty anti strategy. Anti-poverty. Oh, thank you. Okay, no, we can leave that. Up, or sorry, we can certainly um, go and get some information on that. That's not a problem. Um, anything else members want to bring up under AOB? No. All right, then. I'm going to then move to agenda item 11, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. Our next meeting uh, will take place on Thursday, the 9th of September. It says here, time to be confirmed, but I'd imagine, uh, yeah, we're going to have many, lots of early starts into the autumn and, and winter period to get through what we have to get through. So can I thank members um, for their time? Can I wish them a, a, a peaceful and, uh, uh, recess? And um, thank you very much, members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, too, Chair. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. And all, all the staff, thanks very this much. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee.